We're live, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. But I guess in a way, we're all alive. We're all living here on this planet. And what matters is what we do today will affect this planet, this solar system, this galaxy, this universe forever. It is a moment of forever, kind of like the title of the Willie Nelson album came out three or four years ago. It is Monday, November 7th, 2011. And we have got several very informative guests. Uh, we've got uh, Liz Retzig joining us. We've also got uh, Adam Kokesh uh, coming on. And they're going to be breaking down the incredible crime of people drinking raw milk, producing raw milk, and a lot more. And I think I'm going to bring up 9-11 truth to Adam because I've never really gotten his, his real position on that uh, and several other issues. Now that they claim the Iraq war is drawing to an end, uh, he spent some time over there as a public affairs sergeant. I'm going to get his view on the PSYOP operation uh, in Iraq and where all of that is really going. That is coming up. But first, let's get into the news here. And boy, does it get crazier by the minute. Ron Paul has come out and said that we should offer Iran friendship, not war. And see, Ron Paul, as I've heard him speak, talked to him many times, as you know, and uh, read his writings, he knows what happened in Iran. He knows the U.S. and England threw out a government that was pro-USA and put in the Shah, and then actually put in the current group of mullahs that are there today. That's what Iran-Contra uh, was all about as well. And that's why Ron Paul has come out again. And they're like, this is insane. You're not for preemptively striking them. The U.N. has been in there. They've said they aren't building weapon systems. Uh, but now they have a new IAEA report coming out saying Iran's developing long-range missiles and might be able to build a nuclear weapon. And so that's the basic uh, excuse that they have to go into the country. And Iran's also come out and said that somebody's blowing up their facility. Somebody's planting bombs, shooting people, and they blame the United States. But my intel is Israel's already got commandos on the ground. And hell, five years ago, Bush admitted they'd funded four terrorist groups out of Iraq to go in and attack the country, including three groups with connections to Al-Qaeda, similar to the groups they've now, well, actually one of the groups is the very group they've given control of Libya. So amazing information on that front. But we heard that Saddam would be able to build a nuke in a month, that he had yellow cake from Niger in Africa, and that he was gonna kill us if we didn't attack him. And here is uh, the Haritz article. Iran will be able to build a nuclear bomb within months, IAEA says. isn't. Isn't that funny? Because this is the same group uh, that told us uh, reportedly there were weapons of mass destruction uh, in Iraq. So absolutely amazing on that front. Now let's go ahead and go to this short clip of uh, Ron Paul on uh, Sunday on Fox News. Ask again. And he said, let's be friends with Iran. Let's trade with them. The Russians had tens of thousands of nukes. North Korea has nukes, Pakistan has nukes. We're not having war with them. It's wrong to just attack them. Let's go ahead and go to this clip. Would President Paul do anything to stop Iran from developing a nuclear weapon? Only by a change in foreign policy and, and treating them uh, differently. But the one thing that I'd caution is some type of an overreaction. Well, maybe being uh, offering friendship to them. I mean, we, didn't we talk to the Soviets? Didn't we talk to the Chinese? They had thousands of these weapons, and we worked our way through the Cold War. Wow, they had thousands. I think Russia had like 30,000. China has thousands. Israel has 800. I mean, does Israel have to be attacked right now because they have 800 weapons? Very, very bizarre. And then you find out our government helped put in the mullahs that are there in 79. They overthrew in 53 the legitimate government that was pro-West. But Mohammed Mosaddegh wanted to keep some of their oil money, just some of it to build up the nation. And they said, no, you're a third world country. You've got a little bit of brown in your skin. You, you don't get to have any of your money. And now we've spent tens of trillions in the last 20-something years, now it's 30-something years, in fights with the Arabs and Muslims, and then to the east, the Persians, all the way into the rest of Asia. 
I mean, this is pointless. There are political powers that want to keep humanity fighting with each other so that we're too busy killing each other, giving money to the military industrial complex, and it has to stop. These wars are not in the interest of this republic, and Ron Paul is right. This needs to end. This guy predicted everything that's happening with the economy. He predicted everything that would happen with the Federal Reserve. He's been proven right again. And by the way, most of the Israeli government has been against this war. Former head of the Mossad's come out against it because Israel is going to totally turn the world against it. And it's going to be attacked by all of the different factions that surround it. It's going to unify those factions. And so even most Israelis in the polls are against what's happening. Okay, that's our top story. Continuing with Israel, we've seen the different camps, the mega banks, Israel, the different lobbies, the military industrial complex, the Christian evangelicals, God bless them, they mean well, but... They want to go ahead and have World War III in the Middle East because they'll make Jesus come back. Why? Well, they're going to make him. <laughs> I mean, this is some crazy, crazy activity. It's now come out but gotten very little attention here in the U.S. It's in British and European news that pro-Israeli lobbying group made BBC Sky News change narratives on stories. And the email is public, uh, a secret email, a private email where they were bragging that they were basically controlling and manipulating the news coverage of what's happening. Well, what do you think happened when the U.S. media got behind saying Saddam had nukes and had to be attacked and turned out it was a lie? Uh, so this is a very dangerous faction, the Likudniks in Israel. And, and, and by the way, it's been the Washington Times, a totally pro-Likudnik publication two weeks ago, that he wants to be, that is Benjamin Netanyahu, the head of Likud, he wants to be seen as Churchill fighting Hitler. He is in political trouble. Obama is in political trouble. And so they want a new war to distract from everything that's happening. One good thing about the Herman Cain's news coming up in a few minutes, even though it's a red herring, it looks like just a um, political weapon, is that it's giving the government a distraction right now so they don't start the war in Iran. Because Obama and the globalists have flatlined. They have almost zero support. What tiny bit of support they have is eroding quickly. And so this is when governments launch wars to distract the public. And that's the big danger. Ahead of a widely expected Israeli-led attack on Iran, funny, three weeks ago when I first raised this, I was the kook. But now it's widely expected, and they publicly say they're about to strike. We can still stop it. If we stop it, we'll be demonized for stopping it. But that's okay. Oh, it never existed. There was never a threat if we do stop it. But, and we'll get no credit if Israel does strike it and does strike Iran for being right. But it doesn't matter. It's not our job to be patted on the head. You're actually attacked when you're right. Nobody cares about these media whores always caught being wrong because that doesn't affect things. It's being right that's dangerous. Ahead of a widely expected Israeli-led attack on Iran, Britain, Israel, Communications and Research Center, an elitist pro-Israel lobbying firm, I would say pro Likudnik has been caught briefing the British mainstream media on how to present news items related to Israel, bragging in a leaked email how BBC and Sky News editors changed their narrative on stories after meeting with the BICOM representatives. And then it goes on with other groups doing this in the past. But the point is, the mainstream media is becoming less and less pertinent and less and less relevant because people know what's happening. Now, shifting gears to what's happening domestically here in the United States. Until the new floodplains were, were uh, rewritten a few years ago, around a third of the nation was in a FEMA floodplain. Now more than half of it is. And all over the country, they make around half the population pay the government for insurance in the floodplain. Now, in some areas, they're putting people 150, 200 feet above the lake in this floodplain. It should be you bought the property, if your house gets destroyed, it's uninsurable, whatever. Just like swim at your own risk. But now, it turns out powerful corporate interests have signed deals with the government to snatch the property around waterways. Here's the headline. Missouri residents upset by order to move lake homes, some of which have been there 30 years to 50 years, in some cases 80 years. Wow. It says here, first it's 30, then it's 50, then it's 80. The are 80 years. And, and, and this is what scares me. I've got friends and family that have houses 
that are out on Lake Travis, and they're uh, over 100 feet above the lake high level. There's no record of water ever going up there. And FEMA's saying, doesn't matter, pay us $10,000 a year in insurance. You pay it to the government. I mean, what a scam. What a screw job. And the level of tyranny you will live under is the exact level you put up with. Of course they made a deal 12 years ago to secretly steal the pension funds of dead and dying military because the big insurance companies are the big mega banks. Bank of America and others have been caught taking houses that they never even owned. They just take them and the judges are bought and paid for and they give them to them. These are criminal groups. And now they're saying, you know what? Used to, the feds couldn't be in your state because of states' rights, and the state made the rules on property rights, the people, the legislature. But a few decades ago, they said, you know, we want to expand floodplains because folks get flooded sometimes, and so we're going to make you buy insurance from us. Now, a few years ago, it's, you know what, we're going to raise the level to basically the top of Mount Everest. You can't have a house, okay, because it might flood, you know, once every 16 trillion years. And then it expands out from that point, and they say, you know what, listen, you little pieces of garbage. We're just going to not let you have a lake house, period. But by the way, they're coming in and saying, we did order that you've got to be out of here within one year, but turns out you could pay us a bunch of cash and take care of it. <laughs> you're like, well, you're the government, I guess. I'll bend right over right here for you. There is no end to this. Not in Germany, not in Russia, not in China, not in Cuba. Every country where you learn to bend over to government, there's going to be people in government that are going to want to service you in a painful way. And it's time to become aware of this. Your home is your castle under English common law, under common sense and so many other cultures. And they're going to take, well, my God, half the country's in a floodplain. I mean, these people are not going to stop, ladies and gentlemen. They're ordering thousands of homeowners just in one Ozark stretch to get off their property. Get ready. There's no end to what these bankers will do. Now, here's another article. We've had this for years in Austin. But Rahm Emanuel, Mr. Goldman Sachs, Mr. Banker, Mr. Um, well, I mean, he is his daddy ran the Ergun terrorist organization in England. He's, he's a, actually an Israeli military officer. Uh, but side issue, I mean, I'd be mad if he was a Russian military officer or a Mexican military officer or whatever it is. I'm just getting a little bit tired of it. Rahm Emanuel, who has got even bigger black circles around his eyes than I do, a guy that looks like he's with the Joker or something, like one of the Joker's henchmen, he's come out and he's, he's saying, for the minorest of infractions, the smallest, we're going we're gonna to double the fines. And in here it says, we're going to go from $600 to 1200 if your grass hasn't been cut. Or if you haven't trimmed your trees, and we're going to decide. But the big bankers, they can steal tens of trillions and get away with it. Very, very scary. And, of course, he took over for the Irish mob boss, Mr. Daly, whose daddy had been one of the most famous mob bosses in history. And I'm sick of it. I'm tired of the Irish mob. I'm tired of the Israeli mob. I'm tired of the Italian mob. I'm tired of the German mob, the, the Mexican mafia, the whatever, the Japanese mafia, the Chinese mafia. I'm sick of it. They all operate the same. And they all think we're here to be bent over a barrel. Now we got the FEMA mafia. We got the Dixie mafia. We got the good old boy mafia. Everywhere you go, you go to East Texas, and you'll have some redneck. And I, I mean, I guess anybody who lives in the country is a redneck these days. I come, I guess, what you call from rednecks. But we're sitting there, and somebody comes over, because I'm like, what's that? And they go, well, you must not be from around here. It's this idea of these mafias, these gangs, to take over society. I'm sick of it. I want my private property, and I want it now. Uh, but the feds have a different plan. They called for an internet kill switch over our society. And uh, in 96, they put in takeover boxes and all radio and TV that's broadcast. So even if I go out on my own system where it's broadcast AM, FM, UHF, VHF, or cable, that FEMA put boxes in that you got to pay for under law as a broadcaster as part of your license that everything runs through their box. Well, their box doesn't work too well on top of violating your First Amendment. But everything's got to be wired through their piece of junk system. And they were going to take over. First they said 10 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever we want. And they said they're going to start breaking in with government programming. That's That's been announced years ago, and I've covered it. Well, because of the outrage over this, because before the FEMA box tells you to flip to their frequency, but they've always had the power to not have an engineer or board op do it, they could just do it. So they are going to, on November 1st, during a Homeland Security, martial law, continuity of government, 
uh, internal defense operation coming up in just two days at 2 o'clock Eastern, 1 o'clock Central. I'll be on the air, and my AM and FM listeners will have the government break in and take over the broadcast, and no human will be on the other line of the station getting the machine's order to do it. It sits there barking orders at you with different codes. They will just do it themselves. And again, I've talked to, here's the scoop. I've talked to Texas Association of Broadcaster high-level people years ago. I've talked to the former head of their, of their engineering society. I've talked to national figures off record. And I knew this, again, back in 1997, I made a film about it. It's actually my film, Police State 2000, as well, in 99. I knew all this was coming. They've told them in meetings, testing them, seeing if they were ready that in the future the government will break in for five, six, seven hours, whenever at once, uh, with messages about anything you can imagine. And that's why they are announcing they're gonna take over your cell phones, they're announcing they're gonna take over everything. They're gonna break in, they're gonna have telescreens at Walmarts, shopping centers, you name it, they're already going in, bossing you around. It's about government forcing its way into your life, saying trust no one but the bankers that run this government that's gang raping you. That's basically the message. Uh, so uh, that, that's an Infowars.com article by Paul Joseph Watson. Concern over public anxiety causes feds to shorten EAS alert. They were going to take over for a longer period and announce the great gracious leader. Oh, oh, yeah, I forgot. This first broke back in February in federal news radio where Obama was going to have a message. Obama was going to test it. And I got to be honest with you, I was really looking forward to this. Uh, on Wednesday, because the creep factor of them actually using this and having Obama. See, this is so much off the charts that I can't even articulate to you how bad it is. People accuse me of exaggerating sometimes. Yeah, pull up Federal News Radio, and they interviewed a Fed, and uh, it was a FEMA uh, subdirector, and uh, they said when it first broke, that, Ob I mean, that was our first article earlier in the year. We actually shot a video about it. We've played it here. And, and they actually said in there, that, uh, yeah, there it is, Federal News Radio. Type in Obama to test uh, EAS. And, and the point is, you are going to hear the dear leader, Kim Jong-il, I mean, Joseph Stalin, I'm sorry. I mean, Adolf Hitler, I'm sorry. I meant Pol Pot. Hold on a minute. I meant... I meant Fidel Castro, Hugo Chavez, whoever. You were going to hear Ceausescu pop in and take over. This was going to be rich. But they pulled back, which again shows that they're trying all of this. There it is. Guys, just type in Infowars.com after it. Obama to test EAS, Infowars.com, up there in the Google search. Up there in the NSA search, it'll come up. It doesn't matter. I've shot promo videos about it showing the news article. It's up there. Okay, I'm babbling incoherently as usual. Uh, let's go to the next story here. Yeah, there it is. Obama launches total takeover. And the Washington Post um, said that Obama, yeah, there it is. He'll call your cell phone. He'll break in over the radio. Yeah, that's it. Actually, if you go back to that article, somewhere in there, they got the Federal News Radio article, too. The point is, the creep factor, that not only do they make them put in emergency takeover systems, something other countries don't have, but now they're not going to give the station just the basic power to flip to it themselves. Okay, let's go to the next story. Are people worried about this? Are they worried about uh, the, <laughs> the total... Police state, are they worried about people all over the country told, you live on a river, a lake, a pond, or even a floodplain, we're taking your house. And they actually bulldoze them. I had callers about this today. In some cases, you won't move out, so they just condemn it and bulldoze you. They won't pay you for it. Instead of being worried about that, or instead of worrying about Herman Cain not knowing, he's like, I'm really worried that China might become a nuclear power. we got to stop that. They've been one since the early 1960s. They've had ICBMs for about 20 years that can vaporize the entire United States with MERV technology in them that they got in the mid-90s, okay? So they had the intercontinental ballistics probably 25 years ago, but 15, 16 years ago, they had MERV technology. So all of that's a big threat. The economy imploding. You know, the fact that he worked for the Federal Reserve, he wants new taxes on top of old ones. All of this is the reason not to like Herman Cain. Instead, they say, you know, it's funny 
Herman Cain's poll numbers have stayed the same are gone up under this. So they bring out Gloria Allred, the Democratic operative, to, you know, to say, my God, he assaulted a woman, he touched her leg or whatever. Okay? Whatever. I don't know if it's true or not. All I know is the reason the American people aren't getting upset about this is because they know about Bill Clinton. We'll put the World Net Daily article up there. Bill Clinton settled multiple cases with women who said he'd beat the hell out of them and then bite their face, which is what real rapists do. I mean, bite until they're bleeding. Bite their lip. Hold them with his, with his, his, his teeth on their lip. That's something reportedly psychos do. Bite them while they're bleeding and rape them. And I've interviewed people that were involved who'd see him going to Jennifer Flowers' house, and then state police would come and break their, break their legs and gouge their throat out, and they barely live because he was having sex with so many women. The point is, all these fake feminists and people, they just want to make this about playing men and women off against each other as part of divide and conquer and as a way to go after Herman Cain because it's scaring Obama. This is pure Democratic Party garbage. If Herman Cain was a Democrat, he could have kids all over the country like Jesse Jackson. He could be raping women like Bill Clinton. He, hell, he could be dying Core Halliburton kidnapping little kids and, and making snuff films with them. But because he's seen as a conservative. He isn't a real conservative, but to demonize real libertarians and real constitutionalists, they're gonna to try to destroy Herman Cain. It's disgusting. Uh, here it is, the rape of Juanita Broderick. And we've got the quote here uh, on the third page. She felt a little uneasy meeting him in the hotel room, but felt a real friendship towards the man. I didn't feel any danger in him coming to her room. When Clinton arrived, she had coffee, ready on a little table under a window overlooking a river. Then he came around me sort of with his arm over my shoulder to the point, the little building, and he said he was real interested if he became governor to restore the little building. And then all of a sudden he turned around and started kissing me. And that was a real shock. Broderick pushed him away and said, no, please don't do that. And Clinton, and told Clinton she was married, but he kissed her again. This time a bit, and this time he bit her upper lip. She tried to pull away from him as he forced her onto the bed. And I just was very frightened. By the way, feminists came out and attacked her because they're not really feminists. They're there to divide the family, put our children on Prozac, Ritalin. These are scientific CIA technicians. It's been declassified that Gloria Steinem was a CIA operator to break up the family. Uh, continuing. And I just was very frightened and I tried to get away from him. And I told him, no, 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 I didn't want this to happen. That he wouldn't listen to me. But he was such a different person at that moment. He was just a vicious, awful person. At some point, she stopped resisting, she explained. It was a real panicky, panicky situation. I was even to the point where I was getting very noisy and you know, yelling to please stop. But it's the governor, nobody, there's state police outside, honey. He does this every day. And that's when he pressed down on my right shoulder and he would bite my lip. And it just goes on from that point. I'm not a paid news reader, don't read off teleprompters. So that's what all of this is about. It's about dividing men and women, breaking up families, using fake feminism as a way to attack the family. But meanwhile, a system that truly destroys women, bisphenol A and the plastic giving them breast cancer, all this other garbage, that's all ignored. And that's what's happening with Herman Cain. His problem is he represents conservatives, even if he isn't one. He's got to be demonized. He's got to be destroyed. He's not a trendy establishment eugenicist who's out there raping women. And that's why the feminists are going to attack him, because you can look it up for yourself. They're all globalist intelligence agency run. Now let's go ahead and go to the next story. And you saw out in Oakland, the veteran shot at basically point blank range with a high powered uh, tear gas canister uh, for daring uh, to uh, not run when the police said, get off the streets, we are your God. Uh, well, we now got a cameraman out there groveling to his lords uh, saying, is it okay for me to film you? And their answer was, gods do not speak to mere scum Americans. They fire tear gas rounds or rubber bullets into their faces. And here is a clip of that. Daring to 
can video the lords in black uniforms, the banker boys. Is this all right, my lord? And by the way, all over the country now they're reporting if you videotape police or ask them questions, you're, you're taken to jail, you're beaten, and you're charged, and they try to put you in prison uh, for videotaping them, even though there's no law. I mean, this is North Korea. And, 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 and you know, I don't want to say all the cops are bad, but when they get in black uniforms and get in that mob psychology, they're all standing there playing the part of Darth Vader, and they put the really wicked guys up front who get off on this, and for him it's like deer hunting. There's a scum American, we gotta get his pension fund, I work for foreign banks, gang raking in the country. Of course, he's not thinking that, but that's what's really going on. Okay, so there's that report, my goodness, it just goes on and on, doesn't it? Uh, you know, I don't even know if I have time, revealed how Obama was playing golf until 20 minutes before Navy SEALs began mission to take out bin Laden. They've got new stories out where uh, they've got the Navy SEALs coming out uh, claiming how the White House exaggerated what really happened, but then still supporting the underlying uh, fairy tale. So all of that is happening. Uh, that's basically it for those reports. Uh, we're going to get into the libertarian mindset, the anti-collectivist uh, mindset uh, coming up here with two in-depth interviews here at InfoWars Nightly News. We're going to look at the fact that people are daring to drink uh, non-boiled, non-burned, pasteurized milk in public, uh, something that is uh, challenging the establishment. You'd think in America you could grow a garden or have your own cow, but uh, no, the feds are saying it's a felony in some areas uh, if you try to take it across state lines or other issues. So that is coming up. Please don't forget, uh, you can watch the rest of the restreams of the Money Bomb at InfoWarsMoneyBomb.com. And it is your support and your subscription uh, to PrisonPlanet.tv that makes this transmission possible. And with more on this nation descending into something out of a Kurt Vonnegut novel of a futuristic Orwellian police state is Adam Kokesh. He was a sergeant in the Marine Corps. And of course, he was over in Iraq uh, in civil affairs. I was just asking him uh, uh, right before we uh, uh, got him on the show today, uh, what he did in civil affairs, and he said, well, we were a fig leaf, and, and he'll give you the answer in a moment, but that's not the real reason I got him on. He went and did a great report with his show, Adam versus the Man, that continues on in, in cyberspace and on the radio, to go out and cover uh, what's happening with the raw food raids and how the people are striking back. They are daring to transport raw milk across state lines and to drink it in public. And the big question is, what will Big Brother do? We've seen raids and arrests on lemonade stands. We're, we're seeing the Amish raided and not allowed to ride their horses on the, uh, uh, on the uh, shoulder now. We're, we're seeing the system come down with both feet against the public. I was out camping on our family property in East Texas this weekend, and now they have uh, more, uh, more uh, game wardens out there than they've got uh, cows. I mean, it is just like the Declaration of Independence. All these new offices sending forth swarms of agents to eat out our substance. So Adam Kakesh is going to be talking to us about that. But first, I want to bring up a few other things that are happening uh, in our society. Uh, Adam, uh, wh what was your awakening like? And uh, why did you decide to leave the Marine Corps? And what did you do in Iraq? Sure. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate the opportunity to share my perspective with your audience. Because when, when I was in Iraq, we really believed in the mission. I was there in 2004, civil affairs. We were the good guys. We were the nice ones, shaking hands, kissing babies, passing out money. And it's not that we weren't on the front lines. Often we were almost like more on the front lines than the infantry were. We'd go out on convoys with them and they'd say, all right, you guys can go talk to those Iraqis. We'll cover you from, from, from back here. Don't worry about it. And, and we'd go out and, and uh, kind of get used for bait sometimes. But we, uh, we really believed in our mission. And there are some things that I did in Iraq that I'm very proud of when I made an honest effort to help the Iraqi people, although I really do regret being a part of the effort as a whole. And I realized that in the greater context, my role as a sergeant on a civil affairs team was to be part of that fig leaf of 
Iraq, of creating this mythology for the American people of the idea that we were helping the Iraqi people. So when, uh, when I came home and I, and I, and I got that perspective and I, and I really started putting things into place, you know, I, I, it, that wasn't really what made me leave the Marines because the process for me of, of waking up was, was kind of in, in phases and I, and I think uh, you know, we do ourselves a disservice when we, when we assume that people wake up with a single moment or with an epiphany. But there, there were a couple of big chunks for me that, that came like when, when I got home from Iraq and, and I really expected there to be a reduction in the number of troops. And instead, we had the surge in Al Anbar. And I saw the second Battle of Fallujah unfold after having been in the first Battle of Fallujah. And I was like, well, well, wait a second, something's not adding up here. And I started to really question our foreign policy at a deeper level. And I started to look for principles behind it. And I got out of the Marines only because, really, I was, I was satisfied with my service in the sense that I'd had enough. One tour was enough, risking my life once. I actually trying to go back. I didn't go back again because I got in trouble uh, for bringing a pistol back the first time. And, and seeing the hypocrisy in the, in the way that the military organization handled that was, was very frustrating to me. And, and to be honest, getting in trouble and being a bit of a troublemaker in the Marines had me leave in a way that I was just disgruntled enough to really start questioning things. And I'm very grateful for that. I, I mean, I think it kind of speaks more to my, my personality as being a, a troublemaker or having a certain disdain for arbitrary authority in the first place that, that got me in that situation. But I'm really grateful that it turned out that way and that I was given the combination of statist military experience with uh, you know, an, an experience that, that caused me to really wake up to the true nature of government, the true nature well, Adam, of power in this world. Sure, I mean, I, I tend to agree with you. Waking up for myself and most other people is is a process and it does tend to happen at different gateways levels of understanding and life is a process we're always hopefully waking up more in fact people don't s tend to sit in one spot i've noticed historically you're either on a trajectory to wake up and learn more and more or a trajectory of kind of closing down and only buying into slogans and propaganda targets uh, people in the lowest common denominator and the whole system is geared to make us lowest uh, common denominator and to go with what's popular and what's easy and and what's simple, uh, and, and certainly I'm waking up and having epiphanies all the time and understanding. Now, on the subject of 9-11, then we'll get into milk and basic food freedom, which is you know, so basic. Mm -hmm. I have seen you say with Luke Radowski when you had your show on RT go, well, Luke, uh, you know, how was it when you were first covering 9-11? You know, now you've grown up and don't, you know, really believe that anymore. And then Luke was kind of no, like, no, I well, well I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but, but I mean, well, okay, well, correct me in a minute. The point is, I've seen you, you don't think 9-11 was an inside job, do you? Uh, that's not really true. I, I don't have a firm belief one way or another. I really am agnostic on it. I think it's important to keep an open mind. I am firmly uh, confident in my belief that what the government has told us is utter crap designed to cover something up. And, and what that really is, I'm not comfortable coming to any particular conclusions on. And, and I feel like I could if I, if, if, if I had done the research that you have, and I absolutely respect the conclusions that you have come to. And, and, and I support people raising awareness. I support people sharing any alternative to the government story of what happened. Um, I, you know, I could assign from my own research, my own inclinations, what I think is likely to have happened, what is relatively like, likely to have happened. I don't think it's impossible that it was an inside job. I think that's one distinct possibility. Um, I'm not going to publicly talk about what, how likely I think that is, uh, you know, what percentage of probability I would personally assign to that. Um, I know for some people they've said that's the absolute conclusion, 100%. It had to have been an inside job. I absolutely respect that. Um, I, that, that's just how I feel about it. I don't think it's, it's uh, I, I think it's a great issue to bring people in. It's a great issue to wake people up and to get people questioning the government. That's why I, I support the 9-11 truth movement. I support people like Luke Radowski doing what they're doing. Uh, but even more so than that, I really support the perspective that guys like Luke Radowski have gained as a result of their questioning of 9-11, their understanding of government that they have gotten as a result of their questioning. Sure, sure, but listen, Adam, I, I wasn't trying to start a fracas, and I'll be honest, four or five months ago, I'm laying in a hotel room, and RT's on every hotel I've been in, and I'm sitting there watching it, and I just kind of saw you say, well, and then you kind of grew up. It was, uh, perhaps my memory's failing on it. Then I saw a few other statements just just kind of at a, at a glance poo-pooing it and again i'm not calling you out i'm not saying you're wrong and i and and i'm heartened by what you've said but i want to agree with you here on something when i say it's an inside job 
I'm saying the evidence of a cover-up and the official story being completely false end to end, I don't know exactly what happened, but I know one damn thing for sure. They're lying about what really happened. The official story is impossible, and they're using it to take my rights, and it's the foundation of the total overthrow of our republic, and that's Absolutely. what I'm pissed off about. And I believe th one of the final levels of really awakening to just how serious things are, it's not a total awakening, but it's its one of the deeper signs of it, is when you realize they stage Gulf of Tonkin. They're shooting black people up with syphilis. They're testing pesticides on foster kids still doing it atomic soldiers they know du's deadly they're shipped tens of thousands of guns into mexico and drugs back in when you realize we've got a criminal global mafia running the government at the highest levels then even if anarchic capitalist you know ideas aren't completely feasible in this working system, it doesn't matter. It'd be better to be in anarchy than to have absolute psycho criminals running our society. Oh, Your absolutely. response, sorry I'm ranting. No, no, that's beautiful, Alex, that's beautiful, absolutely. And, and, and that's why I, I have so much respect for the 9-11 Truth Movement, because it's gotten a lot of people to that point and understanding that nature of government, that it really is a, a disease in society. It is, a, it is a leech, it is a cancer. And when you get those things, when you really get all of those things that you described and you really understand that how government has been behind such tragedy, such suffering, such pain and misery for such a, uh, so many human beings on this planet in our history, that this, this paradigm of statism that's behind it is, is causing so much problem today, you, you get it here, you know, you really wake up, not, not just in, in an intellectual way, but you really wake up in a spiritual way and are compelled to share this message with the rest of society, compelled to be on the freedom movement's leading edge, bringing society into the, in you realize government and the state is the enemy absolutely well even even deeper than that even deeper than that our own willingness to be in denial of our, our own true nature that desires leaders and and, and this is really uh, you know a, a part of our evolution Alex and I, I I try to you know in a way when I get worked up I I, I try to get Zen and, and say listen like let's let's put this in in, in, in the in, in my self-affirming worldview and, and context that that, that gives me a more positive outlook because it's not just the, the, the error of, of the current ways of humanity, it's the, the broader evolution and, and that we have gone from from being pack animals. We evolved from pack animals. We evolved from tribalism where whoever could pick up the biggest rock was in charge under the law of the jungle to where we are today. And let's let's be let's celebrate where we have come and that the vast majority of human interactions are free of force and fraud and coercion. It's just isolated now to the government. You know, we've almost, we've come a long way as a species and, and we as libertarians who want to reduce government further by saying, look, let's observe moral law in all of society, not just everything that's not government. Let's hold everyone accountable. Let's embrace morality to its full extent and respect each other's liberties. We are bringing humanity into the next phase of evolution. We are sharing something that is is, is, is how humanity is going to realize its next level of potential. And you know what? When we get there, when we get to that point, when we overcome the paradigm of statism, and, and I see it as something happening over the next 20 to 100 years. Some people say sooner, some say a lot longer. But when, there, there will be the next challenge for, for our great grandchildren to overcome it. And that's just part of the beautiful evolution uh, and, and what it means to be sure, a human sure. being in the world today. Well, well Adam, Adam, without getting into a debate about about you know, Darwin's evolution versus evolution, we know cars evolve. We know computers evolve. We know technology evolves. We know viruses evolve. We know bacteria change. And you're absolutely right. We go from hunter-gatherers and bands to tribal groups, and then to agrarian groups, and then into city-states, and then into states, countries, empires. And there's no doubt that, that well, w without saying the name of the video, because it's a family show and I've promised to not, to, to, to even control myself. I, I happened to see a video this morning, I didn't have time to watch the, the whole thing, but I watched most of it. And you're talking to this mindless neocon woman, and about she's effing, supporting the war, and I, it's, it's warning. Supporting the war in Iraq will make you sound like an effing moron, and it's true. And I proved it. <laughs> well, I mean, sure, she's always against. Well, uh, uh, briefly talk about that little interview. You were going to the Koch brothers event. Right. This is the Americans for Prosperity annual convention, and these are people that. Uh, you know, it, it, it's hard to understand uh, where they're coming from all the time with uh, the people that are really behind this because they're advocating for free markets, uh, but they're, they're not always advocating for real freedom. A lot of them support kind of establishment Republicans, and a lot of the crowd is more 
mainstream conservative, which we know is not really conservative so much as it's kind of right statism as opposed to left statism. And they have their own pet projects and things that they want to use the government for. And, yeah, and they love the drug war. They, yeah. uh, I mean, but, but how can even these mainline right wingers like Mitt Romney, four open borders, abortion, gun control, carbon taxes, road Obamacare, and they and, and I'll tell them this, they go, I don't want to hear that. I mean, these people really are a joke. I mean, they're as dumb as the Obama supporters. I mean, if, if they say they're mainline Republicanism, but they don't even follow that. I mean, it's incredible. It's like Rick Perry doubling the size of Texas government, bringing in three new taxes, and he says, I make Texas a nice place to live. Why? Because it's got a little less government than some other states, so it's a little better. I mean, this guy tells us government, Rick Perry actually says, I made Texas great. <laughs> well, I think this is why people are enjoying my videos, is that when you confront people's delusions with the truth, in conversation the right way, it, it is guaranteed to reveal what is then exposed as really an absurd, overwhelming idiocy, for, for lack of a better way of describing it. And it demonstrates what we're up against, because it's not education, it's not facts, it's not a matter of the, the truth getting out there. It's religious belief. No, it's, it's more than that, Alex. I, I really think it's uh, you know an, an inability to see past our own delusions and be, being held back by our own fears and being willing to accept a comfortable tyranny rather than, as our, it's been called by our founders, the animating contest for freedom and having belief in your own self-worth to think, I don't need a leader. I don't need someone to be the it's alpha. It's being player. your own leader. Right, exactly. And I think what's happening is, is, is part of this human evolution is that individual empowerment is getting so good that people are really grasping onto the tools of logic and reason and, and self-empowerment like never before. And like my generation, the millennials, and I, I'm, I'm on the cusp, I'm 29 years old, and you know, when you're on the cusp, you always say you're with the younger generation. But the millennials, those of us who grew up with the internet, and, and I know you, you, you think the same way, but you know, not, you're a little bit older, and not everybody, as, as you know, who's older, is able to, to adapt to this new form of, of information war, this new way of looking at the world through the internet, taking advantage of the tools that are available to us. But my generation, almost all of us have it hardwired in a certain way. You, know, you, you, can't, you can lie to us, but you can't get away with it for very long. And when we have the truth button right there, one click away, we can go to infowars.com. You know, you just, you can use the Google, you can, and it's all right there. It's very, very difficult to hide the truth these well, days. Well, you're right. It's a giant divide where, you know, there's so many old folks who are already awake, so they're already on board with us. But I notice we don't get a lot of new old people. I mean, 60 and above, because they still are watching TV. They've got a computer to go, you know, check stock prices or, you know. Uh, yeah. And children. Yeah, yeah, see emails the grandkids or see jokes, you know, that their kids send them. But they, they are not checking things. They're not, and, and they still don't know who Ron Paul is, some of them. You know, it's like because the, uh, the, the media has tried to ignore him. But going back, uh, j just to quantify, I wasn't criticizing people having religious beliefs. I'm saying politically it's almost like a dogmatic Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, the attachment to the religion of statism is the same as the uh, attachment yeah. to any religion. And, and I have great respect for people of personal faith and great disdain for people who feel like they need an organized religion to relate to God. Exactly. Organized religion is the problem. But let's but I mean, just quantifying my thought here. I went to our family ranch this weekend and, we, and they've got a deer camp down there. We lease it to some deer hunters. And I'm over there, and they all knew who I was. So, I mean, that's the problem now. I can't even just, you know, they're like, when we leased this, we didn't know it was Alex Jones. Uh, and I'm going, yeah. And uh, is it, I, I like some of your show, but is 9-11 really an inside job? And the guy looked at me, and he said, are you a Christian? And I said, yeah, I'm a Christian. He goes, well, so am I, but there's a lot of holes in that. And he goes, I choose to believe it's not an inside job. And by the way, these guys were all engineers. They were all real smart, and, he, and, and it was profound. I said, you choose. And he goes, yep. And, th and this was a smart guy. He, he literally did a crime stop like 1984 and said, I choose not to believe this. I said, well, what about the passports coming out of the plane to the ground, being found that day? I mean, do you really believe they came out of the fireball, got found in all the dust? And he said, yep. And he looked right at me and just winked. He cannot deal with it. He loves, and in a way, it's almost like men who stay with women or women who stay with men that beat them. I mean, it's yeah. almost like they're committed and they're going to they're gonna take it.
Yeah, yeah, this is this is part of the empowerment, though, that is, is occurring right now. People who understand that they have the truth button, that they can question everything and seek answers. And it's not futile. It's not something that makes your life harder. It's something that makes you more empowered. They are they are coming on to this new understanding, this new paradigm of, of, of self-empowerment, of self-awareness and of realizing that you can be the alpha in your own life. You do not need a leader. You do not need anyone to tell you how to live your life or run your life. And we as a species don't need, don't need people to lead us by force. We don't need to bully people to go along with the common will anymore. We have the tools to organize society. There are no excuses anymore. None of the things that our parents' generation were convinced we needed government for will, will we tolerate systems of violence supporting in the future. We're going to find all the ways to make all of those systems superfluous. That's the promise of our generation and the internet gives us the perfect tool to be able to do it and the way to show that there is no excuse that we need to turn to Adam, violence. I agree with you but that leads us to this point the system knows this awakening's happening it's throwing everything it's got into the mix right now to block this awakening from happening because if you look to the founding fathers that's not 235 years old that's 235 years new. It was the greatest advancement in the Renaissance, in the Awakening, in the Enlightenment. The globalists are trying to bring us back to 5,000 years ago, or 5,000 BC, or 10,000 BC, in an attempt to cement their control. And I don't see, I don't see that paradigm working. But look at the founders. It, it was all about how many languages you could speak. It was all about your intelligence, uh, uh, being an inventor. It was about your mind and being goal-oriented and building up society and people b being, being loved instead of being attacked or you're producing too much, we're now going to steal from you. It, it, it is the lowest common denominator versus versus the Enlightenment. So, so, so I want to give you a couple minutes to, to, uh, to expound on that. And then in closing, because we're about to go to break and come back uh, with uh, one of your colleagues who's fighting, and, and of course you covered this, uh, Liz, uh, who's, who, who's dealing with the uh, milk police, but, 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 but speak to where you see this awakening going. Excellent. Yes, Liz Reitzig is doing great work for uh, for food freedom with the raw milk freedom writers. But um, about what you said, I think you give the super class a little bit too much credit, Alex. I, I think that we, we know that there is a super class out there, that there are people with ungodly concentrations of wealth and power in the world today. And I don't think they're really a, a, as coordinated a, a, as you give them credit for. I think there's a lot of competition within that group. I think there's a lot of disagreement. There are some rival factions. And, and I know you know this, and, I, and you know far more about the details of, of what they do than I do. And I certainly uh, you know, concede to your, your awareness of, of the facts. But I, I really think that there will always be a super class to the extent that humanity tolerates its own exploitation. And changing that fundamental paradigm of society is what's going to take that power away. So the people who are in that position to exploit see an opportunity and they take advantage of it. And they provide something for the people that we really want. I mean, if the people really need leaders, if the people have this psychological need to be led, someone is providing that. Someone is providing something of value and they are getting they are getting a lot of money for it. They're being very well compensated, if you will. And what we are trying to convince people as, as libertarians, people with the message of freedom, is that you are better off in a real economic sense saying, no, we do not need these leaders. And I think that, uh, as you point out, there is in, in the current system, and, and by that to, to reference specifically the current systems of government and centralized banking and fiat currency, uh, the, the existing mechanisms of exploitation, yes, in, in many ways are failing and they will, they will fall in, in chunks and, and fade away. And, and as they fall in chunks, particularly the, the big chunk right now, the U.S. dollar system, there are going to be people who are going to get their last licks in on an economy that's beholden to the U.S. dollar. I think that's really what you see with the euros own crisis. It's a good excuse to make more money, to exploit more wild people will accept it. It's what you see with quantitative easing here. Ben Bernanke is going to get in his last licks on this system for, for all of the people that are hooked up to it and benefit from it. And when it fails, there will be a new system of whatever exploitation is tolerated by the broader population. And, and, and it will go on until it is fully rejected because people realize that they are beautiful, free, independent human beings who should be in charge of their own lives. Adam, I think you've hit on a key area here. The, the social engineers, and, and they've written books and white papers on this that are public that we've covered, they're masters at human psychology and activity. 
So they create exploitive systems that are outside the free market, that are cheating, that use force by ganging up against the individual or smaller groups, smaller countries, mm -hmm. and then they rationalize what they're doing. But then inside the countries, they then exploit the underclass and, and, and then have them wage war against the middle class, saying it's wrong that somebody's got more than you. As you said, there's always going to be a superclass. But are they oppressing other people? Are they doing it through cheating? Or are they doing it through the fact that we want to buy their products, we want to associate with them because of their skill, their athleticism, their beauty, their scientific mind, their constructiveness, their literature? Again, that's what gives the world diversity. And we have to realize, you know, uh, all of us are, are endowed by our creator to have this pursuit of happiness and that we're all created equal in, in different gifts, but that some people are going to shine more than others, are going to have better opportunities, are going to have better luck. And any attempt to ever suppress that is going to create a greater tyranny than you were fighting to begin with. Well, I, I think that super class will sort of, I, for lack of a better way of saying it, sort of naturally fade into the general population with time. And I, and I don't mean that there won't always be people who are extraordinarily rich compared to the rest of the population. I, I think in a free market uh, where you have industrial technology, there will be people capable of providing so much value to the rest of society that they end up being perhaps magnitudes even more wealthy than the rest. But as, uh, you know, as we evolve, as we become more prosperous, more capable of providing goods and services that people want to consume, uh, and, and more capable of being in charge of our own lives in a way that doesn't let those concentrations of power come to exist in the first place, uh, you know, I, I think they will really largely come to a sort of more natural distribution, whereas right now we have an unnatural distribution of wealth uh, concentration, whereas naturally in a, in a market with specialization of labor, you're going to have peaks of concentrations of wealth, but you're not going to have massive, yeah. massive vertical spikes. And all of those really exist because of government. As we get past the government status paradigm and everybody is, is empowered and everybody's personal wealth is brought up, I think overall you're going to see that come to a much more natural. Well, by the way, the, I mean, as you know, the globalists always talk about the economy overheating, people being too wealthy. I mean, they actually spend all their time trying to suppress the wealth. I mean, the truth is that there's yeah. such an engine that the system is always admittedly trying to suppress it. Now they want to sell this post-industrial crap. Uh, but the truth is nobody wants to see their children starving. And, and the whole collectivist model of getting people dependent, we see what nightmares that creates. It is the animating contest of liberty. Adam Kokesh, we'll have to cover the milk with the next guest, but it was great having you on. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity, Alex. All right, there goes Adam Kokesh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, amazing information. And hey, uh, even if you don't uh, agree with it all, it's thought provoking and it, it scares you because deep down, you know, he's on to some major truths here. So is Ron Paul. So are we here at InfoWars. Now, Adam and others, they like to talk about where we can go and, and, and show examples of what true freedom can do. I'm here in a desperate battle to expose the globalist because before the population in many respects can wake up to the deeper truths, or simultaneously see them, we also need to identify the true monsters that are in control right now. We're going to go to break and come back and talk to our guest who's actually out there in the streets facing down uh, the corrupt establishment straight ahead on the other side. If you're watching this later on myriad web channels out there and want to support these ideas and want to have access to it first and in higher quality, become a subscriber for 15 cents a day at prisonplanet.tv. And I should add, we're only running this till the end of the month, you can get 15-day free trial right now at PrisonPlanet.tv. So PrisonPlanet.tv or InfoWarsNews.com. We're going to go to break right now and come back with the conclusion of InfoWars Nightly News. Stay with us. If you believe in this information and want to support its viral spread, go to the InfoWars store at InfoWars.com. We've got the new G.I. Joe InfoWars t-shirts. We've got the incredible ProPure gravity-fed filters available at InfoWars.com in the store. We've got a new DVD, Sign Us Under Attack, the Don't Tread on Me flag. We've got all sorts of different bumper stickers to help spread the rebellion virally. It's all there, wristbands, citizen rule books in every order. Order online at InfoWars.com today. The water filters, the canteens, it's all there, InfoWars.com.
And now, my friends, we're going to discuss the real threat to America. No, it's not the tens of trillions foreign banks have stolen or the fact that world government's openly being announced in a world currency system or Israel saying they're getting ready to strike Iran and reportedly they have special forces already attacking facilities inside the country. Iran is calling it U.S. terror attacks. No, that's not an issue. Not our country basically turning into a depression uh, ridden system. None of that is a threat. Our borders wide open. 60,000 dead in the last three years inside Mexico. Uh, our government caught shipping cocaine into the country and guns into Mexico. None of that is the threat. In fact, for 11 years, it wasn't a threat that Bernie Madoff, uh, the SEC knew, was ripping off people for tens of billions of dollars and they covered it up. No, none of that is a threat. The threat is Amish producing cheese and raw milk, selling it to their neighbors or bartering it. Uh, the problem is food co-ops uh, selling or bartering with friends and family raw milk. No, that's the threat here in America. And last week, a new type of freedom riders took action for the civil right of producing their own healthy, natural food. And they publicly drank raw milk, but even more wickedly, publicly drove, to illustrate the absurdity, across state lines and consumed milk uh, in front of the Food and Drug Administration offices. And joining us is Liz Reitzig. She's one of the founders of Farm Food Freedom Coalition. And uh, I have a few quotes here uh, by the Food and Drug Administration, uh, where they say that they think that it's improper for anybody to ever consume raw milk. Here it is. Uh, it is the FDA's position that raw milk should never be consumed, agency spokesperson Tamara N. Ward. Now, there's no law against it, but they'll still basically try to arrest you somehow uh, for it. And so joining us um, uh, today to discuss this is Liz Reitzig. And uh, you guys haven't been arrested yet. I mean, you're a mother of five. That makes you even more Al-Qaeda-ish. Uh, you're politically involved. That's even more dangerous. I mean, you're some type of serious thought criminal uh, here, and, and you're enemy number one because I see reports of year-long stakeouts of Amish, always a big problem, uh, for selling their neighbors milk who really are undercover people who beg them to sell it to them. So tell us about the organization. Tell us about uh, your move that's actually elicited the Food and Drug Administration to now respond. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on, Alex. And uh, second of all, it's technically, uh, in Pennsylvania at least, it's okay to sell raw milk to your neighbors. What's the, the illegality here is taking it across state lines because somehow that milk becomes dangerous as it moves across the imaginary line that we call states. Um, but that's where the real criminal activity is, is just in crossing that state line. And in response to the egregious acts that you just described by the FDA, a group of moms from California and the D.C. area, we banded together to form the Farm Food Freedom Coalition specifically to take on and to, to bring to a broader audience what is happening with the FDA and our small farms. Well, I would also add not only um, is this unconstitutional in my research and view, it's another example of a federal power grab. They're, they're claiming the Commerce Clause, aren't they, whenever uh, th they declare jurisdiction. It's not that it's unsafe when it crosses that state line, even if you live right on the state line. It's that the feds uh, basically want to control all commerce in this country. Right, right. That, that's exactly right. Now, but their, their whole argument is that it's, it's never safe, that raw milk is inherently dangerous. Uh, I mean, I've researched some of it, but you probably know more than I do. What's the history of how we went from regular, natural, wholesome milk not being pasteurized, being uh, uh, you know, basically uh, extracted every morning and then delivered to your door, and then I guess Big Agra came in the last 50 years, demonized it, got state laws passed, so they could take dirty milk, spoiled milk, boil it with all the pus, blood, the rest of it, overworked cows, and then ship it across state lines across the country and then basically use government to shut down their competition, real milk, so the counterfeit, basically liquid cheese, uh, pus derivative, uh, that is now supplanted real milk, and real milk is an endangered species being hunted down by the federal stormtrooper Gestapo. 
Well, actually, just the abbreviated history of real milk is that you know, at the turn of the century, between the 1900s, between the 1800s and 1900s, what, what was happening is investors were investing in dairy cows, but where the dairy cows lived was in confinement operations within the cities so that the transportation was much shorter to get to the populations in the cities. And this is very abbreviated. It's well worth the research if you're interested or if anyone's interested. But those cows, you know, they were hand milked. There was no closed milking systems. There was no refrigeration. Sometimes the workers were very sick and, and they were fed. More importantly, the cows were fed the waste from the distilleries, which is not cow food. So you can imagine that that milk was not ideal. Some of it was diseased. And when the advent of pasteurization happened, you know, this, this was something that, that did help significantly for a time but now we've got the knowledge of how to take care of our animals very well you know we feed cows grass which is what they're meant to eat and we've that's got that's your opinion that's a conspiracy theory okay <laughs> fair enough you know some people prefer milk from grain fed cows so so no no no, no. Or, own, or, but... or like in Europe the awful Feeding cows rotten meat is good. No, no, I mean, I'm being sarcastic. Uh, you know, sometimes you're in the store and it says grass-fed beef or whatever. It's kind of like an oxymoron that you would have to tell somebody that. Uh, but, you know, nowadays, if you criticize government or industry in any way, they just, they just say conspiracy theory. So it, it was a lame attempt at humor. And, and, of course, I was oversimplifying, and I think in a way you may be a little bit too, because from my research, there were certainly some of the big dairies that did have problems, and then they wanted to use pasteurization to cover up uh, right, the problems. Right. But then there were some dairies that you know did have good practices as well. But I think the angle you're hitting on, which I've certainly read about, uh, is that it was uh, uh, already big corrupt operations that were used to give old-fashioned milk a bad name. Right, but there was also, at the same time, there was also plenty of proponents of certified clean raw milk, and the pasteurization won out at the time because it was more efficient. But now we're seeing this wave of people, I call it a food renaissance, because it's people who want to get back to eating really good food, wanting to get back to knowing the sources of their food, and so they're returning to direct farmer-to-consumer transactions, including a, l a large population of people who are returning to raw milk. Now, now, I want to give you the floor here instead of going back and forth with a lot of questions because I've seen the video that's been posted online. Pretty powerful protest. Got a lot of attention. Uh, and from the press reports I've read, made the FDA and its demonization of raw milk look silly. Uh, so basically, I mean, as a you know, raw milk expert, as an activist who's certainly researched this more than myself and most, most viewers, what is the state of this food renaissance right now? And uh, what, what is the state of the attempt to crack down, or, or correct me if I'm wrong, intimidate uh, people that are producing raw milk and selling it uh, or bartering it? Because from what I've seen in the news, uh, there is an attempt at least to crack down on it like it's medical marijuana or something. All right. Well, actually, much worse than that. But um, just in terms of where it is right now with the people, there's, there's people all the time who are asking for it, who are searching it out. The Weston A. Price Foundation, they have a campaign for real milk that people can look up and find a producer near them. They do a great job of educating about why people would choose raw milk and, and where to find it. And um, it's really hard to fully estimate how many people are drinking raw milk right now but i can tell you it's just a fraction of the number who want to there's constantly people who are looking for it it is kind of hard to find because to the second point the fda and the state ag and health departments are ferociously cracking down on our farmers like they're horrible criminals just for producing and in some cases providing across state lines raw milk for human consumption and with that what we're seeing is for example, armed raids on farms where they're going in and confiscating thousands or tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment and food and sometimes personal belongings. And we're also seeing undercover sting operations on small farms, buying clubs and co-ops, which, I mean, we know how ridiculous that is. And I mean, this is milk we're talking about. It's nothing other than milk. But yet, like the, the buying club that I'm a part of, the FDA conducted a year and a half long undercover sting operation on it just to discover that they were in fact providing 
raw milk. And by the way, this wasn't done in secret. They do the investigation to, 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 to I guess, hype themselves up like this is really something illegal and later if they need to show it to a jury. I've seen them walk into places selling organic vegetables with guns drawn as if that makes you a criminal because they act like you're a crack dealer. I mean, I mean you can really see the, the theater that's involved here. Right. And uh, sometimes I wonder if the enforcers know exactly what it is that they're going after there, because I can only imagine like how they come home that day and say, you know, their spouses. So how was your day? And they say, oh, well, I spent the day going after food. I mean, so I really wonder if they have any idea what it is they're actually dealing with. Well, well how did you get involved in all of this and then continue with the state of uh well, well, raw foods, whole foods, period, because I have a few other questions. Well, I got involved in all of this because when I, when, well, when my first daughter was about one, one and a half, um, she was showing, she had some serious digestive issues and she was showing signs of being intolerant to conventional milk. And my sister's also highly allergic, so it was natural for me to suspect that. And we did some research, my husband and I did some research, and we found that we wanted to ha try her on raw milk. And we did, and her digestive issues completely cleared up. And there was a time when my second, after my second daughter was weaned that we couldn't find it, and we put them both back on pasteurized milk, and they both got very sick from it. So ever since then, we've decided, you know, raw is the only way to go. We're not going to try again to put them on pasteurize it just it did not work for them so that that's how i got involved just in that in just purchasing it but then when i realized part, part of what happened was in maryland the health department who regulates milk banned cow shares now a cow share is when several people go in together and each own part of a cow and then get the milk from their own animal and the health department redefined that as a sale of raw milk, specifically to make it illegal. Yeah, and God forbid people in the cities right. start creating their own farming co-ops. That'll end the big Wally world. Uh, that would end concentration camp farming of chicken. That would be people actually going back to the land by hiring their own people to do it. My God, that would end the power monopoly uh, over people in North America. We can't have that. Of course not. So they redefined it. They just took something and redefined it because when you're the government, you can just redefine things. And so they made it illegal, and that really upset me because here that that's when my daughters couldn't get it. And so it really pissed me off that here they are undermining my authority as a parent. Now, mind you, I can feed my children soda pop and lollipops all day long, perfectly fine. Or formula that's half corn syrup. Yes, right, right. But get raw milk for them? No. Well, but by the way, I've read a lot of history. If you go back a, even 100 years ago, or even 60, 70 years ago, I was, I was reading cases in Germany, the, the, the doctors, before they were told by HMOs what to do, they would say, your child can't hold down regular milk, get them, uh, you know, get them raw milk. I mean, this has been well known. Or if they have a problem with that, get them uh, raw goat milk or raw right. goat milk that's been powdered or Jenny milk, jackass, you know, uh, uh, donkey milk. I mean, all of these, this has all been known for cultures forever. You know, you figured it out yourself, trial and error, but th this has been figured out by people and it's been known and there's, but, but here's another question I have for you and, and you can finish up with the other story or, or, or finish that and then get into this. I was having an argument with a family member about no raw cheese is legal. I don't care if you read in the news that they raided a group who was, you know, a, a farm that was creating, uh, uh, creating raw cheese. You can go to Whole Foods and buy raw cheese all day long. In fact, most stuff from Europe's raw cheese. But right. and then I went and showed them on the Whole Foods website. Yes, frequently asked questions. In fact, folks, uh, we can probably show this after you leave. It says yes, we sell raw cheese for now. So, so the point is, how are they raiding people producing raw cheese, but then big companies are allowed to sell it? I mean, this. Uh, well, yeah, the the raw cheese has a lot of regulations around it, including certain aging requirements. So in most places, it's it's legal to sell raw cheese that have certain aging requirements met. And the I think you're talking of Morningland Dairy, in Missouri. They got raided and they got shut down and they got told to uh, destroy their entire stock of cheese, which completely put them out of business. And the reason for that is 
because there was some listeria discovered on the cheese. Now, that never made anybody sick, and listeria can be present on lots of food that doesn't actually affect people. So they didn't, it didn't matter that this cheese hadn't made anybody sick and that it's a small operation. They just arbitrarily shut them down because of that. There's so many facets to this. If you were on national TV for just three, four minutes, you had the floor. What are some of the points you'd like to make? Um, what has been the success of your uh, Freedom Riders for raw milk? Where are you going from here? Well, the, the Raw Milk Freedom Riders, what we did is we really challenged the FDA on their complete ban on interstate transportation of raw milk. And they issued a statement in response saying that they do not intend to target individual consumers on this. And that, you know, that's, that's a response. It's not a satisfactory response because we're not going to stop until the ban is completely lifted. It's absolutely ludicrous that in a country that calls itself free, we cannot, or our farmers cannot travel across state lines for raw milk. And we're going to keep going with it until it's, it's challenged more than that. Um, part, another part of the reason we did it is to bring some attention to the issue because, you know, the average American doesn't realize that uh, the FDA has criminalized farmers and parents who transport raw milk across state lines. And so when people realize just the kind of control that the FDA has over us and our food supply right now, they get really upset. And, and that's a big part of it, is getting a lot of people upset enough to, to create some active and, and positive change around that. Liz. You said a food renaissance is happening, um, it is. And, and I'm seeing that myself as somebody who's just you know, starting to graze the surface of it and, and, been, and been watching it for a few years. And I see this as one of the most fundamental revolutions against the corruption, big agro, this consolidation, and the whole thing Monsanto uh, is engaging in, really a military-style takeover of the biosphere, uh, the, the, the very life cycle of this planet. Uh, Quantify, though, as somebody on the front lines, why do you say we're in a food renaissance? Well, I say it because people are coming back to wanting really good food. And, you know, you don't have to be elite for that. You don't have to be, you don't have to have a large income for that. It's just about going back to the source. Like, you know, not so much frozen foods or microwave foods anymore, but it's, it's getting fresh foods. And a lot of times local foods, maybe growing your own or maybe just getting a CSA and getting your food every week from a farmer. But it's, it's this new, it's for people, this new experience of tasting really good, really fresh food and including raw milk. You know, it just tastes extremely good and much better. It's, it's much better than the conventional, in my opinion. Of course, everybody's got their own taste, but that's what the people in yeah, the I mean, A lot of people would rather have a MSG filled hungry man or something uh, instead of, you know, right. you know uh, eat something right off the farm that tastes a lot better. That's their opinion. <laughs> but 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 you should have a right. Uh, I mean, I certainly see a huge concerted crackdown intimidation across the board trying to mop up these burgeoning organic farms and things that are springing up. But I see in the communities I talk to that being a backlash uh, and, 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 and causing an even bigger backlash. The system's backlash is triggering an even bigger backlash against it. And it's really a wake up call that, wow, this big agri takeover is really a sinister plan. Um, well, Perhaps, uh, but what what the, the good thing that going for us is that every time there's a big crackdown on raw milk or on an organic producer or something like that, it brings more people to fresh, local, healthy foods, raw milk. So it's actually the way that the government and the big industries are shooting themselves in the foot. Sure, their crackdown yes. is causing a backfire. So you agree, you're seeing that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So where do you see it going five years from now, if this continues, will the forces of consolidation be successful or will they fail? Oh, ultimately, they're absolutely going to fail. I mean, we've got so many passionate Americans around wanting good food. And, you know, you've got chefs and the chefs all want to have food that tastes the way it's supposed to taste. You know, an egg is supposed to taste like an egg and milk is supposed to taste like milk and all these other things are supposed to, they have distinctive taste and the chefs, the chefs use this and as people participate in this food renaissance, you know, the average American is, is transformed by it. 
And it's, right. there's no way that they can hold back the tide of Americans who want good food. Well, that's good news. Liz Reitzig of Food. Uh, in fact, let me give people your website uh, up there. I was reading it off the screen. Uh, what's the best website for people to visit? It's the Farm Food Freedom Coalition, or it's farmfoodfreedom.org. And they can also go to our Facebook page and uh, like it, become a fan. All right. Thanks a million, and thanks for standing up for all our basic freedoms. Well, thank you. Thanks so much, Alex. All right. Good to talk to you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's it uh, for this edition of InfoWars Nightly News. And it is people like Liz that are going to turn this country and this world around. It is our everyday personal decisions, voting with our choices, voting with our own dollars, that's going to change the world. It doesn't mean any of us are perfect or that we're going to get all the answers right, uh, but it is. It's one of the few areas where we really see success taking place. And with cancer exploding and all these other uh, degenerative diseases expanding, it's no doubt that it's due to the eugenics diet that the globalists feed us. And, and it is part of a concerted plan, as the White House science czar has said. They want to put sterilants in the water. Well, they already are. We've tested the water. They're adding it. Radioactive isotopes, sodium fluoride, you name it. It is unbelievable. Great job to the crew. And our other guest this evening, and uh, Lord Willem, we'll see you back tomorrow, 7 o'clock Central, right here at InfoWars Nightly News. And, of course, we've archived uh, the 27-hour broadcast we did Thursday and Friday at PrisonPlanet.tv as well. We couldn't do any of this without you. I want to thank all of you that supported us with the InfoWars Money Bomb. And uh, though the woods are lovely, dark, and deep, I have miles to go before I sleep. I'm going to now leave here and go to my home and do at least three hours of Coast to Coast AM this evening with George Norrie, coasttocoastam.com. I'm Alex Jones signing off for now from the front lines of the Info War.